In this video, we're going to compare the E1 reaction and the SN1 reaction. So the question we want to answer in this video is when do we know we're going to form an E1 product and when do we know we're going to form an SN1 product? And this is an important question because the E1 and the SN1 reactions have a lot of things in common. And it's probably worth our time just to review the key things that the SN1 and the E1 have in common before we can go about answering this question of when we're, know, when we're gonna form the SN1 and when we're gonna form the E1. So remember the first step in both of these reactions is that the leaving group leaves. So this is always the first step. And this is actually the slow step. And the slow step just depends on the concentration of our substrate. So the rate law is always what we say unimolecular. It's always unimolecular. It only depends on the concentration of substrate. And that's where the one in the, the E1 and the SN1 comes from, is that it's unimolecular. And consequently, they both go through formation of a carbocation. So in both cases, we're going to form a carbocation and of course a carbocation being quite unstable is is going to be the rate limiting step in this reaction formation of this carbocation and remember what the key factors are that determine carbocation stability well tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary which are more much much more stable than primary carbocations so that is what governs um, elimination and uh, E1 and SN1 reactions. We're always going to favor, they're always going to be faster for tertiary over secondary over primary. And, and let's not forget that, that also resonance can play a role in stabilizing carbocations as well. And the last factor that, that the SN1 and the E1 have in common is we always have a weak nucleophile or base. So in this case, we have methanol uh, is a perfect example of a weak nucleophile or base. You can also have examples like water or other alcohols. It's always not going to be something which bears a charge. It's going to be a neutral, neutral species. Okay, so those are the key things which both the E1 and the SN1 reaction have in common. So let's just look at what this reaction has to, to see what the major product of this reaction is going to be. And from there, we can start to answer the key question of when we're going to see E1 versus SN1. So here's a very typical uh, tertiary alkyl halide substrate for the E1 and SN1. It's tertiary. And we also have a weak base or nucleophile. And our product here is an SN1 product. Uh, we've just broken carbon bromine. We're forming carbon oxygen. And the other product present is the E1 product. And so what I can tell you is that experimentally, as it turns out, the substitution product is always going to be, under most conditions, the major product. And elimination is going to be minor. So substitution, so normally, under normal conditions, and we just say normal conditions, meaning like a tertiary alkyl halide with water, nothing else added. Uh, substitution SN1 is going to dominate over E1. Okay, so that's major and that is minor. Now, however, there is one variable which can play a role in favoring the E over the SN1 if you give it enough juice, and that is elimination reactions are favored more by heat. And maybe it would help to make a little diagram here. So we draw out a sheet like this and say this axis is the rate and along the bottom here is the temperature. Okay, and let's say that this is 100% yield and this is 80. And let's say this is 20. I'm going to keep this a little bit vague here, but our major product at, at lower temperatures is going to be our SN1 product. And as we increase the temperature, the, the amount of, of E1 or SN1 product is going to decrease. Let's draw it a little bit like this. 
So this would be our SN1 as we increase temperature. And for the E1, maybe at, at low temperatures, the amount of E1 product is very small. But as we increase the temperature, we're going to see a gradual increase in the amount of E1. And remember that the E1 is favored by temperature because there's more entropy. There's a greater entropy factor in elimination reactions than there is for substitution reactions. And if you need to review that, there's a video on that subject that we can, you could go over. There's more things formed in elimination reaction than a substitution reaction. So there's going to be a greater entropy term. And that becomes important for thermodynamics of this reaction. So heat is something which we can use to favor elimination reactions more. So all things being equal, the same low temperature substitution is going to, is going to be major. But as you increase the temperature, you are going to get more elimination products. So that is one variable which you can change. Now there is a second variable or second case where eliminations or E1 reactions tend to be favored. And here's an example. So if we take, for example, a tertiary alcohol and we add a strong acid. Now this is a strong acid, this is sulfuric acid, and it's also non-nucleophilic what this means is that the conjugate base is this, and it's quite resonance stabilized. This is not likely to attack a carbocation. Uh, so in the SN1, remember the, uh, we need a nucleophile to attack a carbocation. But if we use a strong acid like H2SO4, which is going to generate our conjugate base of, of um, HSO4 minus, this is not going to attack the intermediate carbocation. So you can see it as H2SO4 or H3O plus, either uh, reagent will do the essentially amount to the same thing. And this is the elimination product, and this is major. So one exception to substitutions being favored over eliminations is if you take a, a tertiary alcohol in the presence of a strong non-nucleophilic acid, you will tend to get elimination as your major product and also in, you know, substitution is, is going to be minor. So that is one good exception to know when comparing E1 and SN1 reactions.